Right, I think I'm going to start. Okay, I think whoever's going to be here is here. Um, I'm Keith Sylvester. I've been in pink therapy long enough. Uh, it was quite nice to do this. This is based on a little bit on um, a workshop I ran uh, a couple of years ago on, on about being elders, which one or two of you were on. Um, so I thought it's a, it's a vast subject. And I'm going to divide this into two little bits. One is um, a little survey I put out to those who responded and said they'd like to be asked questions. And I've got some responses to those questions. And the second half, I'm going to talk about um, my own view of what it means to be an elder. Okay. And um, I'm going to start with um, a sort of definition, really. Um, this is my own definition. I didn't get it off wiki or, or whatever. An elder is someone who has life experience, maturity and standing, who can offer wisdom and guidance to the generations that follow. So it's just like my working definition, really. It doesn't have to be an old person. Um, many of you will remember that advert, Sonatogen fortifies the over 40s. You know, it's like 40, 50s and you 40 anyway. And being 50 is not actually that old, let's face it. So I, I put out a, a series of, of, of random questions, and um, I'll read one or two of the, the sort of answers I got. Um, the first question, as you, got old, as you get older, does sexual desire, whether for a partner or for men in general, play a greater or lesser part of your personal identity? Um, one person wrote back and said, sexual desire is a greater part of my personal identity, so I can... Uh, since I can still physically and safely act on my sexual needs and enjoy the experience. Another person said, although sex and sexuality are still just as important as they ever were, as a 52-year-old, my body is communicating greater ambivalence. And so although desire is strong, putting that desire into action feels less urgent. Okay. Um, my own experience is I don't think sexual desire has actually gone down. I was, I was led to believe it would do. Um, and uh, I find even over 60 it doesn't, but uh, I think people's experience will vary. My second question that I put out is, is there still such a thing as a gay scene, and how important is it to you? Uh, one person said, I think there is still a gay scene, and I'm comforted to know that it is still available, but I've never relied on it and don't find it particularly relevant to my needs. Perhaps this is connected with being in a long-term relationship, using apps for sex when I desire it, and having a full social life. Um, question three, there were some very interesting responses. This idea of, is there a gay community? And are gay men lonelier or more isolated as they get older? I think it's an important question. Certainly when I was young, uh, the image I was presented, certainly by my mother, was I'd be sitting alone on a park bench in a dirty old raincoat, feeling very miserable for myself in the rain, which never actually happened. Um, and various people. Um, one person said, I have no idea what is meant by this. I never have. This is about community. I've always thought that whoops, of this phase being used by some people to homogenise all LGBT people. I don't think that gay men need be lonelier or more isolated if they choose not to be. It may not be possible for them to be with environments that are gay-friendly if they are living in rural locations, have to rely on public transport, are disabled, or have financial difficulties. Uh, LGBT organisations that provide services to GME tend to be in large cities and often only operate a few days a month and during the day. They, thus, they do not provide a social outlet um, to those who are working. Um, one person said... I think that my gay community exists amongst my group of friends. It doesn't rely on a physical gay space, as it might have done. As we have become more comfortable in gay and straight commercial environments. I have yet to experience loneliness linked with age, but suspect that I would be able to respond to it in a proactive way if I did. Although I work with an LGBT client group, I haven't encountered this as an issue. Um, and so on. Um, another person said, difficult to define what is a gay community, but there are many different types of communities, formal and informal. Gay men are more likely to be lonely when they grow old, 
if they are not in a personal relationship or are socially community, socially community active. Loneliness is a growing trend in the older population in general. So there's no particular difference maybe for LGBT people. Question four. Do you experience a generation gap with younger gay men? If so, what are the key features of this? Um, one person was talking about the Scottish experience. In Scotland, where I now live, I do not feel welcomed by as many gay men in most gay venues, particularly those aged under 30. On the rare occasions that I do go to commercial gay venues, my experience is of being looked at when I go in and my presence questioned. I'm always aware that I'm often the only person over 35 stroke 40 in the venue. It's the same demographic as when I lived in Scotland in the late 70s, 80s. Some things haven't changed. I'll just whisk through these because I want to allow a bit more time for other things. Is there a gay spirituality and does age play a part in developing a sense of this? And in what ways do we get wiser as we get older? Um, did I get any interesting answers on that? Um, one person said, there is a concept of spirituality, but not sure um, if there's a particular gay one. Okay. Uh, another person was not sure what was meant by spirituality. Um, one person said, I haven't thought about the idea of spirituality amongst gay men. I think that I've got, ol that I've got older, I've become much more comfortable about my sexuality. And so with that, think about it less. I trust that as I've got older, I'm, I remain attractive to other men, or the ones I'm attracted to, uh, whereas in the past I may have questioned that and feared that sexual and, and attractiveness and desire would run out. I'll talk about that in a minute. Two more questions I put out. The year 1967, everyone remember that? Hey man, flower power. Uh, summer of love. Uh, it was a significant year for gay men in the UK given the law changed. I made a mistake here, it didn't affect Scotland. What do you think has made the biggest difference to the experience of gay male life since then? And could the clock ever be turned backwards? Um, I came out in Scotland in 1979, so I have difficulty seeing 1967 as being significant to me as 1980. Before that, I was breaking the law. Um, for me, the biggest difference has been the willingness to be visible and vocal about issues such as Section 28, which seem to be trying to limit gay men, men's openness and demonise gay sexuality. The other biggest difference has been the health issues and how sexual practices change with the arrival of HIV. I don't think the clock can or should be turned back. Um, I'm just trying to think if somebody else wrote an answer to that one. I don't have one with me. Um, and the final question I, uh, was how do you see or imagine the varieties in older gay male experience being metropolitan versus non-metropolitan, white versus non-ethnic white, and able-bodied versus disabled? One person had something quite interesting to say. Um, uh, if I can find it. Uh, yeah. An overlooked area and often ignored or, consideration or considered is the group of people with disabilities that are not visible. I have epilepsy, which is not visible. I expect to be treated in as many different ways by gay people as I do by other people. This can range from being accepted as having a neurological condition that sometimes has to live in an adaptive way to others who will judge and stigmatise me. Um, this is just a sample of, of responses um, to these questions. Um, I'm not going to make a great play on them, and I would quite like to continue uh, with other people who might want to address those questions. Um, my conclusion from that is that there are as many different experiences as there are people in the room and uh, I don't want to make a generalisation about people over 50. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit, going back to my, my elders definition, of what constitutes um, the wisdom of being an elder. And I'm going to put up some ideas 
not on not on that, but on the, the flip chart, which I want to go through. Um, and then we'll open it for some discussion. I'll go through these and explain what I mean by these. These are um, six things I've identified as being part of what our elder tradition could be. First is, I think we're experts in loneliness. Um, I, would, I think it's fair to say that um, most LGBT people grew up with a sense of, at some stage, being the only person like this. We've had to get used to loneliness, but in so doing, we've actually become experts in, in dealing with it. Now, that may or may not help us when we get bereaved or whatever, but we've known loneliness uh, or, and being alone from a very, very deep place. Um, we've had a variety of experience. I'm, I'm, I was hesitated in putting sexual experience, but I think that's what I mean, really. Um, that I think it's still fair to say that compared to a lot of other uh, sections of society, uh, gay men who've been out a long time have probably tried to be with a lot of different people. Not all gay men, obviously. Um, and I think back over the years, all the people I've been to bed with or had relationships with, uh, I've gained so much knowledge of just just people's different environments, the way they live, different psychological expectations. We've got a lot of varieties of experience of people to pass on. And that's nothing to do with even being a therapist. That's just to do with having slept around in my youth. Um, this one, I, I had trouble to write up. I call it celebration and decline around attractiveness. I think it was Julian Clary who said... Uh, once, that once you're over 30, nobody looks at you in a gay bar. I'm not sure it's quite true now. Uh, but I think we've had to get used to celebrating our bodies and facing or at least a perception of decline around attractiveness. And for a lot of people, that involves remaining attractive, uh, still fostering a sense that one can be attractive, that um, age itself doesn't have to mean necessarily decline, but I, I don't know any gay man who hasn't had to negotiate that in, in some way. And I think we can pass on a, a, a wis wisdom about around that to young people who are very invested in the way their bodies look and their sexual attractiveness to get love and attention. I know when I was young, I absolutely equated being uh, love and getting attention with being, being perceived as sexually attractive. And I thought, God forbid a day if I didn't feel attractive anymore, what would happen to me? Would I fall through the floor? But we can discuss this. Another important area, which I think is very, very important in the gay world, which is about the ability to self-parent and take personal responsibility. Um, I, I think there's a lot we can do for younger gay men who uh, you know, may not have had the best upbringings, may not have had the best relationships with their fathers, may not have had role models in their lives. And I think it's very, very important to pass on the skills of how to look after yourself, how to take responsibility for yourself. If people haven't got friends that can do it, hey presto, they come to therapists. And I know in my therapy practice, um, I do a lot of work with younger gay men who really, really don't know how to look after themselves. Um, they can't turn to their biological parents. Um, and the acceptance of complexity of relating, I think that um, it's linked with this idea of community as well, which I put a question mark on, that we've, got, we've had to get used to ideas that ex-partners become family, uh, that they become extended gay family, that uh, we may include, say, ex-partners in our lives as friends. The heterosexual world does that as well. I think we've led the way in understanding that because I know a lot of heterosexuals who go, oh no, once I finish with a partner, I won't, you know, can't be, you know, can't see that person again. I think we, we're much better at including different sorts of relationships we have with people into our lives and maintaining them. It is linked to community, which is a big question mark, because some people say that, as one or two people say, there isn't really such a thing as a gay community. Um, I know with my 
with some of my clients who feel very isolated. Um, I do encourage them to form friendship networks, to go uh, and join activities that are suitable for all sorts of age groups. Uh, I know myself, if I didn't belong to certain gay groupings, gay clubs and things, I don't mean commercial clubs, I mean activity clubs, um, I would probably feel quite isolated. And I think we're very good at it. I think we're very good at building a, a sense of gay community. Um, I'm not saying the rest of the population doesn't do this. Uh, uh, I'm just saying that we uh, have something to, particular to pass on to younger, younger gay men. Um, if I had to pick one of these, I would say the first one and the self-parenting one are particularly important. Uh, and I think, I certainly when I was younger, there, there weren't that many older people I could turn to. Now I'm in that older generation. I can see what I, what I can offer. And um, that counteracts any feelings I might have that when a, a young, so-called attractive person comes into <coughs> my into my room, I don't go, oh my God, what do they think of me? Uh, I accept I have other things to offer them. I do believe we're going to have to stop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.